Welcome. I'm so glad you joined us for worship today. Today we will listen to stories that that speak to the power of community. And one of the things that leaps out to me as I think about our second lesson is the phrase that says, knowledge puffs us up, but love, well, that builds us up. That's so true. Love builds up community and love builds up one another. And so I'm so glad that you've come to join us in worship today to hear stories about God's love so that we might both as a body and as individuals be built up to be all that God has created us to be. So come on in and let us us listen to these stories that build up one another. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. Would you please now join me in reciting Psalm 111. Hallelujah. 
I will give thanks to the Lord with all my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God shall raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reciting Canticle 17. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have been so accustomed to idols until now, They still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may never cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Gospel of Mark. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching? With authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As many of you know, I have two daughters born about two and a half years apart. The introduction of the latter into our household went fairly as expected, the usual challenges and more than a little bit of humor. I remember, in fact, even that very first day that we brought um, our younger daughter home from the hospital, our our two-and-a-half-year-old, who was already quite verbal at the time, she looked at me and she said, can't she just stay in the car? So it went. Actually, they they existed pretty, pretty peacefully for, I don't know, maybe three years or so, mostly because um, the second born didn't demand much of mom and dad. And, and, and so the, the eldest, well, she could sort of rule the house quite clearly. But, but I remember a, a, a turning point. It, it, it came one night at the dinner table. The, the ever vigilant oldest sister looked at the plate of her youngest sister and spined some peas uneaten there, she said, you know, you got to clear your plate before you can have dessert. Well, the youngest, both embarrassed and kind of angry at being called out, she looked at her sister and she said, you're not the boss of me. Maybe if you have um, some siblings or multiple children, maybe you've heard that response before yourself. Well, you're not the boss of me. The gospel story that we hear today with Jesus encountering a a man possessed by demons. You know, it seems that 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 man looks at Jesus in that moment and, and says just about the same thing. You're not the boss of me. So here we are just in the in in the first chapter of Mark. Right. And and Mark just gets right down to business. This story that we hear today, scholars believe it it, it really captures the the first public appearance of Jesus, the the first day of 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 his public ministry. And here he is in a in a synagogue on the Sabbath. Mark whose favorite word seems to be immediately. Mark immediately 
signals to his readers both the, the, the heart of Jesus' mission and, and, and the, the primary focus for Jesus' audience. He is there to teach, and his primary and first audience are the religious, are the so-called faithful. He's in Capernaum. It's a small fishing village on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He's He's there with um, those disciples whom he's collected not long before. And, and he comes into the synagogue and apparently, well, apparently he blows them away. Listen, listen to that, that response. They were astounded by his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. We don't know what he said. You, you can imagine that as traditional, he, he would have spoken about the passage from the Torah assigned for that day. What we do know is, is that what he said was, was stunning, was, was, was powerful, and, and I would guess more than a little unsettling. What we also know is that how he spoke, it was not as the scribes. That's not just a, a simple observation, not as the scribes. It, it, it actually is, it's, it's really foreshadowing for a tension that will run throughout the gospel, a tension that Jesus has with the, the religious elite, a tension that ultimately will result in his death. Jesus taught with authority, but he did not teach as the scribes. And right there, right there, we begin, we begin to sit up and pay attention. This guy has something to say that will change everything. Oh, he's still talking about the commandments. He still is talking about what it means to be a faithful Jew. Make no mistake about it. But, but he is breaking open the commandments in a new way. And, and the scribes here, look, the scribes get beat up upon as, as we look back on them, but, but, but they had been doing their job dutifully, if not faithfully. It just, it just seems that, that perhaps in, in, in teaching the tradition, they, they had, had lost, uh, what, lost some of a, a sense of, of power and relevance to what they were saying. They, they, they were, were teaching more to preserve than to create. They, they, were, they were looking inward instead of outward, backward instead of forward. And so it's not hard to imagine that, that even as they were tra- teaching the traditional word, that somehow the, the power and the relevance had, had gone out of it. And, and then Jesus, then Jesus arrives on the spot and he teaches a word that, that, that speaks about what it is to be God's faithful community and how it is that we are to follow God's commandment as fully as God would have us. And everything changes. Beginning beginning with that man who's in the synagogue and who's possessed by a demon. The change starts with him first. He he says after listening to Jesus, what have you to do with us? And I think think that this is a question, not not of of a possessed man. Frankly, I think this is, This is a question of a man who sees, who recognizes that Jesus is someone not to to be dismissed, that he's someone with a a new power. I think that this is a a, a question of a man who sees, who recognizes, and and it's born out of that awareness, and it's it's born out of more than, than a little bit of fear. What have you to do with us? He knows that with Jesus' arrival, well, everything is about to change. It might be tempting 
it might be tempting to, to focus on, on the sensational in this short story, the, the, the possession and the exorcism. But, but actually, to Mark's original audience, such, such possessions, such, such physical and, and spiritual afflictions, well, they weren't uncommon. And, and nor was it infrequent that there were those who possessed the, the abilities to, to heal individuals from, from their afflictions. So you see, this, this so-called miracle story, I mean, it's a good story. But actually, as all the miracle stories in Mark, the thing that we're to pay attention to is less about what happens and more about how it happens, less about the actions and more about the actors in this particular thing that we're to pay attention to is this Jesus who has done an amazing thing. Because in healing this possessed man, he demonstrates the authority that he has, not just over the Torah, but over demons. The, the possessed man, he gets it. Because he looks at Jesus and he identifies him as the Holy One of God. That's the most important thing to be revealed in this short story. That Jesus, with all his authority, with all his power, he is the Holy One of God. And I have to say, I have to say, I, I, find it, I find it funny if it didn't, well, if it didn't sort of challenge me a little bit. I find it funny that the one who gets it first and most clearly is the so-called mm, possessed man, not the, the synagogue faithful. Oh, sure enough, they're amazed. That's what we hear. They're amazed. But they, they're still wondering, huh, who is this guy? It's the possessed man who sees him for who he is and for what he is and who identifies him, who speaks to him even, and then who names him as the Holy One of God. He leaves, that possessed man sees and leaves the synagogue that day, a changed man. The rest of the synagogue faithful? Well, not so much. I'd love to tell you that, that they leave and, and they all become disciples, but, but surely Mark would have told us that. He would have said, and immediately they all believe. But that's not how Mark ends the story. Instead, what Mark says is, they kept asking one another, what is this? Do you see they... They left that synagogue. They left after hearing his teaching, after, after witnessing his powers. And they still, although amazed, were wondering, what is this? They still were wondering, what does he have to do with them? They still were thinking, hmm, is he the boss of us? Some 2,000 years later, we've got, we've got this story. We've got the story of four Gospels, right? We've got, we've got um, countless epistles. We've got, we've got the, 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 the mystics and the saints. And, and we've got our own experiences. And I wonder, I wonder how would we answer the question, what does he have to do with us? I wonder, would we say honestly, sincerely, he's the boss of us? It's a good question for us to consider as the modern day religious gathered in, uh, in regular worship. And I think it's, it's a good question for us to consider, particularly this day, um, not just on a personal level, but also on a, on a corporate level. That is to say, what does he have to do with us as a people who make up a church, who make up St. Luke's? We've got our annual meeting, which follows shortly. It's at 11 o'clock, in case you've missed the memo. 
And I think at the heart of, of all that we say and do and imagine should be, what does he have to do with us? If we're going to be different from, from just another nonprofit organization, if we're going to be, be more than just checking the box as it relates to our bylaws and, and having a nice little mm, pep rally, then I think we need, we need to ask ourselves, what does he have to do with us? We need to ask ourselves, what does he have to do with, with how we treat one another? What does he have to do with, with whom we welcome? What does he have to do with, with whom we, we care for in general? What does he have to do with, with how we, we spend our time and our energies and with how we spend our monies? What does he have to do with us? What does he have to do with, with how we understand all that has happened in the past? And what does he have to do with how we embrace the challenges of the future. What does he have to do with us? That's a question. That's a question which grounds us in not just his teachings, but in his example. That's a question which, which, which moves us in the direction that God would would want most. What does he have to do with us? I pray that you, that you let that question linger in your heart as you, as you walk through your own lives and, and you let that question be at the forefront of your mind as we gather for our annual meeting. Is he the boss of us? Jesus, what do you have to do with us? But, but, but let me caution you about this. Even as we might have that question on the tip of our tongues, understand, Jesus, Jesus already has the answer to that question. What do you have to do with us? The, the real work to be done is for us to answer that question for ourselves. Amen. Let us together profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the ways of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, 
and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. The Prayers of the People Let us pray for the Church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Nicholas, our bishop, for all bishops and other ministers, and for the clergy and lay staff of our parish, we join with communities throughout this diocese and pray for seminaries and schools for deacons. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are cl closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your care all those who work for justice, freedom, and peace. We pray for those in our armed forces. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them to the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for Karen Cesaro, Beth Hunter, Alex Myers, Steve Mazur, Joe Taylor, Elaine Decker, Canon D Dina Cleaver Bartholomew, Paula A., Mike, Roz, Thomasine Manikas, Janet Kitchen, Kenneth Hunter, Christopher Gormley, Arlene and Bill Dubois, Joni B., Cole R., Doreen Gardner, Carrie Turgeon, Samantha Mossy, Sophia Martin, Don B., Paul M., C., George Graham, Florence and John McQueen, Madeline, Gary and Cindy M., Sylvia DeFalco, Lou R., Bob Schulman, Andre Cabana, Mackenzie C., Sherry, Laura, Roman, Logan, Spencer Collins, Alexandra Sabo, Kusum Singh, Sam Hop, and Dan Larkin. And during this time of global pandemic, we pray, God of compassion, be close to those who are ill, afraid, or in isolation. In their loneliness, be their consolation. In their anxiety, be their hope. In their darkness, be their light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let us say together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. And again, a particular welcome if you have found us online for the very first time. I'm so glad you found us. Please let me know. Email me at trich at stlukeseg.org. Today at 11 o'clock, we will gather live by way of Zoom for our annual meeting. The invite to that is found in the invite to the worship that you've just enjoyed. I hope that you will join us because the annual meeting is a time to celebrate the life we share, to elect new leaders for our parish, and to hear a bit about the year that awaits us. So please do join us. That's at 11 o'clock this Sunday morning. At 5 o'clock Sunday afternoon, we'll be gathering for a Zoom social hour. Again, the invitation to that is in your invitation to worship, and so I hope you'll join us there. A few other announcements of gatherings. Um, Monday, the Women of Grace will be gathering. There's an invitation in your announcements there. And then Wednesday, our adult faith formation continues reading the Book of Joy. We'll be looking at pillars 7 and 8. And that Wednesday night class begins at 7 p.m. as well.
So again, thank you so much for joining us for worship. I hope that you and your loved ones are well, and may God bless you.